Well, good afternoon. It is my pleasure to welcome you to our uh, weekly research exchange here at the Citrus and the Banato Institute. Uh, I would like to introduce myself. I'm Costas Panos. I'm professor of EECS and also the director of Citrus and the Banato Institute. Uh, some uh, uh, <coughs> instructions about practical things. Uh, everything with your lunch is compostable, so please dispose of trash in the appropriate uh, labeled green bins at the back of the auditorium. Finally, uh, even though all our speakers uh, can entertain questions uh, at any time, we would ask you to perhaps withhold them until the end of the presentation. Uh, there's going to be plenty of time for that to interact. And I've been told by our speaker today that there's lots of uh, props and stuff that you can feel and touch. That mm -hmm. should be quite instructive. <clears throat> questions, of course, can be submitted also live via Twitter. I would like to, to tell everybody that we have an online audience as well. So the hashtag that we use is Citrus RE, Citrus Research Exchange. So I have a few upcoming events that I would like to announce. Uh, first of all, uh, it is uh, time for our annual seed grant. Uh, these are the internal proposal call that we use within the Citrus and the Banato Institute community to create new ideas and to grow them from scratch. So invite principal investigators at UC Berkeley, UC Davis, UC Davis Health, UC Merced, and UC Santa Cruz to apply. And I would like to remind you that uh, our application portal, portal will open on November 30th. Uh, the idea here is to catalyze very early research, but also to foster interdisciplinary work and collaboration across campuses. So you can visit citrus-uc.org or subscribe to our newsletter at the bottom of the homepage in order to stay abreast of this uh, upcoming uh, opportunity. Next week, at the same forum, the Research Exchange, on November 1st, we have a talk by Steve Cousins of Sabjoke. And uh, you can uh, find more information about that online, and I hope to see you here as well. Finally, well, almost finally, I would like to tell you that there is another opportunity going on right now. The Citrus Foundry is collecting applications for the Spring 2017 cohort. Uh, the application portal has opened on the 19th of September and the applications are due on the 27th of October at 11.59 p.m., I'm told. So prospective applicants can go to citrusfoundry.org for more information. And uh, another event that I would like to, to plug is uh, on November 30th. Citrus and partners are presenting the public event Women in Tech Symposium on Innovation and Entrepreneurship at US UCSC Silicon Valley Campus. The, WITI, we call it W-I-T-I at UC, Athena Awards will also be presented at this event to recognize leaders or organizations supporting women in tech. So now it is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker. Dr. Ray Banato is a scientist, entrepreneur, and investor. He specializes in the early commercialization stages of innovation with a focus on startups working for a positive impact on society and the environment. He has successfully developed and commercialized new materials for industrial and consumer goods. Ray holds uh, degrees in biochemistry and computational biology from UC Berkeley and UCSF, and was a National Science Foundation Fellow at the California Nanosystems Institute at UCLA. Along with his siblings, Desi and Tala, and their parents, Dado and Maria, the Banato family's philanthropic efforts focus on the combination of education, technology, and entrepreneurship at UC Berkeley, the Asian Pacific Fund and the Philippine Development Foundation, whose goal is to eradicate poverty in the Philippines through education and entrepreneurship. And I would like to also note that Ray is passionate about exploring remote destinations in search for good waves or snow with friends and family, and truly believes in combining work and play. So please welcome our speaker. Thanks, Casas. Uh, thank you so much, Casas, for the introduction. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here at, the, at Citrus, um, an institute that is near and dear to my and my family's heart. And uh, I think my, one of my goals today is to convince you at the end of this talk that it wasn't, uh, or it wasn't mostly nepotism that uh, led to the invitation to speak here today. And I, I hope to glean some experience um, uh, with the audience here about what it took to start a few companies 
Um, and then where my thinking is, at least in terms of a trend that I see and where I see innovation heading in the world of sustainability and materials. So um, I've entitled this talk, Make Things Better. It also happens to be the tagline of, of the first company I started with my brother, uh, Desi, called Entropy Resins. And I think probably a more appropriate title for this would have been a retrospective journey um, on, on impact and entrepreneurship or impact entrepreneurship. Um, it wasn't, what I'd like to do is just kind of, you know, tell a story here. Um, let me just add, if you have any burning questions, actually feel free to interrupt. I'm happy to, to entertain those. If it leads to a deeper discussion, maybe we'll table that towards the end. Um, but yeah, my, my background, just a little bit quick intro about myself. Um, you know, I'm a scientist and, and uh, entrepreneur, but my background technically is in biochemistry and, and biocomputing or bioinformatics, um, a field that, that I think we've all seen come and grow and be of, of very, very um, impactful um, uh, effect in today's technology world as it meets fields of biotechnology and healthcare. Um, I worked initially on understanding molecules, so how do biological molecules, specifically like proteins and nucleic acids, why do they form the structures that they form, and then what functions do they derive based on those structures? Um, and so I did that, and, and I was in academia for a while. I kind of thought in the beginning I was going to be in academia for a longer while, but I kind of had this yearning and, and uh, desire to, to explore the entrepreneurial side and, and had some passions I also want to explore. And um, it kind of led to thinking around, well, what, what would I do outside of academia? And so that's just a snapshot of, of me field testing one of our products. But it's also the fun side of getting to work, work uh, on, on making products is, is actually going out there and getting your hands dirty and, and figuring things out. Um, and just like any good journey, I want to just kind of start at the beginning uh, around inspiration for how I think I got to where I'm heading now um, as, as an entrepreneur. Um, and this inspiration really is about growing up here in California. Um, we live in an amazing state and uh, my parents were first generation from the Philippines. Uh, my father was, a, was an electrical engineer and my mother was an administrator at, at De Anza Foothill Junior College. And both of them were really passionate about and still continue to be passionate about education. That was, number one, always a priority. The second, though, was we spent a lot of time outdoors. And I think this was probably more the norm back in, in, in when I was a kid, was we went camping and we drove that 79 West Valia Volkswagen bus up and down the West Coast from Mexico up to Canada. Um, spent a lot of time at the beach, in the, in the mountains. And I think this, when I think back, these are some of the best memories I have as a kid, spending time um, exploring and being outside and, and really appreciating nature. And I think that stuck with me and my family as we've kind of um, grown and I have my own kids and I think these are values that I am trying to impart um, in, onto them. The second kind of inspiration was growing up in Cupertino. So we grew up in a suburban area. Um, our house was kind of like right here. Uh, that's actually a picture of my brother Desi skateboarding on this little cul-de-sac we had in Cupertino. Just on the other side of the wall was Apple Computer, back before they owned most of Cupertino. And so we got into a lot of trouble riding these skateboards all around that neighborhood and peeking in the windows at Apple and eventually we got our first Apple computer and we were really into gaming. And so we lived in this world of being outside, but also be, being really engaged in technology. And of course, growing up with an engineering father, um, you know, really kind of influenced us in this di desire to combine our passion for being outside, but with an appreciation for technology and how technology can impact the world. And so that was something that we really love to do and we, you know, it's still a passion that, that is influential in our, in our decisions today. And so when we started thinking about our first company, um, you know, we thought, and this was also inspiration from our father, was, you know, we kept talking about wanting to start companies and, and we, were, we didn't really know what we wanted, we just knew we wanted to do something. And so he kind of had this idea of, well, you, look, you guys are smart kids, you have a lot of education, 
you know, the main thing you should think about is how could you contribute back to the things that you're passionate about, the industry that you're passionate about. And because we're so passionate about outdoor sports, we thought, well, why don't we look at the materials that th these products are made of and how could we improve that? Um, and so just to kind of define the cast of characters here, a composite material is technically um, a material that is made up of at least two other materials. It could be more. Um, this is one example of a composite. And this is a very important composite material. It's carbon fiber composite. And um, carbon fiber usually starts like this, which is just a woven loose fabric. Um, but it, it takes combining this carbon fiber with a material called a thermoset resin. And so a thermoset typically starts as a liquid. And um, one is a resin and one is a curing agent or a catalyst. And when you combine these two, it forms the hard plastic matrix, which makes up the composite. And I'll pass this around, just be careful of sharp edges, but carbon fiber is some of the lightest, strongest material th there is. And, and it's a really important material because as, as, just to go back to this slide, as society's need for energy efficiency increases, right? we need to be more efficient in how we get around. And part of that is using lighter, stronger materials. And so you look at products like the Boeing 787, which was the first carbon fiber plane, um, the Dreamliner, and then BMW's i-Series vehicle, which was the first serial production all carbon fiber electric vehicle. So, you know, in order to get the fuel efficiency needed in these industries, they look to composites. And, and it's a field that's growing in importance. It's been, actually been around for a long time, but we're finding society needs more of these materials. And so we're actually increasing in our use of these types of materials or plastics. So our first idea was to think about composites. And this is in 2005, 2006, when carbon nanotubes were getting a lot of coverage. And uh, this, this was a material that was actually starting to become available. And so just like any good uh, uh, engineer, we love technology and we thought, okay, well, let's look at composites and how can we just stick some technology in it, right? Um, and looking back, it was probably pretty naive, but we worked with uh, Bayer Materials, which was one of the first companies to produce carbon nanotubes um, at volume, although they were still really expensive at the time. And after a little bit of engineering, we figured out how to put it in the composite. We actually worked with uh, Professor Hari Darn across the street um, at the time and, and helped uh, a sponsor a grad student to do some work in understanding the technical, physical benefits of putting carbon nanotubes into thermoset resins. And lo and behold, uh, we made the world's first carbon nanotube surfboard. It also happens to be the world's last carbon <laughs> nanotube surfboard. Um, it's still hanging in the offices at Bayer Material Sciences in uh, Philadelphia, I believe. Um, so we took this idea of something that we're passionate about, outdoor sports. We took something that we thought, hey, let's contribute something back. We're technologists. Let's put some technology in this thing. And we failed. Okay. So where do we go from here? Well, in that notoriety of making that board, we, all, we actually eventually got hired to go work on another project in the same industry, which was in surfing paddle sports. And there's a well-known professional surfer who started a company or was trying to start a company and his motivation was uh, I wanted to make an eco-friendly board and he said okay I'm gonna hire you guys to do this I saw what you did with the carbon nanotubes here's a bunch of eco-friendly materials go and build this um, turned out the materials he gave us were not that eco-friendly um, they just took some oil derived from soy and stuck it into the polymer and said here you go so it didn't really solve anything. In fact, the performance got worse, and that was a big learning lesson. But it was the original idea for our first company, Entropy Resins, because we saw, as we got those materials, we started to look at the marketplace and saw no one was really addressing this. And we thought, well, look, here's one customer who wanted this. Um, what if we put our heads together and just kind of thought about better ways to make a performance polymer, but out of bio-based materials? And so after a couple years of, of engineering and chemistry, um, working through with the chemical industry as a whole and identifying sources of materials, how to put them together, we came up with a formulation. Uh, we ended up calling it SuperSap, and it, it, it was one of the first bio-based 
epoxy resin, which is a class of thermoset resin, uh, formulations out on the market. And so this was like in 2009. Um, the U.S. Department of Agriculture had created this program called the BioPreferred Program, which was a way to quantify bio-based materials in any product. And so we were one of the first products there to work with them on that. Um, and, and I think the important thing to note here is that um, as we started to make the products for that customer, we saw that we got more inquiries about this material than we did the boards that we were making for them. And so we knew we were kind of on the right track. We knew that we could expand these materials into other industries that might care about sustainability. And so our biggest contribution as a company was to really quantitate the impact of using bio-based materials. And so, as I mentioned, we, we quantify the bio-based content, but it's important to know that um, what is the impact of that bio-based content? Um, you know, you, fine, you could put, put you know, soy in something, but how do you know that soy material didn't take more energy to create that bio-based product? And so we started to look at other factors of measuring uh, impact. Um, and that came with, by working with a company called SCS Global, um, which actually is based here in Berkeley, and uh, quantified the carbon footprint the, the, through a life cycle assessment, figured out what is the impact of using our raw materials to make our product versus something that the rest of the industry uses derived from pure petroleum sources. And we found we had almost a 50% reduction, or just under a 50% reduction in carbon footprint. Um, so that was pretty impactful. That was really inspiring for us to keep going and thinking, okay, well, we actually can do good by, by doing what we do and helping companies make products out of our materials. We also worked with third-party organizations that help promote system change. So aside from just making a material, how do you get it adopted in the market? Um, we worked with Sustainable Surf to define a, a, a measure or a program of quantifying um, you know, the impact of these materials in the surf industry. And I think the thing that we're most proud of is through Entropy, as we grew as a company and actually started to make some money and became profitable, uh, we joined a, an organization called 1% for the Planet. This was an organization started by uh, the founders of Patagonia and North Face, where they try to promote in, in, in any industry um, companies to donate 1% of all total sales back to nonprofit organizations who have a focus on environmental impact or social impact. And this is an organization that we're proud of, proudly a member of since 2012. And as a company, we donate 1% uh, of our total sales back to organizations who are working on wildlife uh, restoration, on um, uh, environment preservation, and, and global warming um, uh, impact. And we continue to do that today. Um, one important lesson that I just really want to share, and I think maybe for those of you who've read the book Crossing the Chasm by Jeffrey Moore, you've, you're familiar with this concept, which is, you can also think of this as the, the other uh, schematic of the valley of death of technology. Um, but the idea here is that most new ideas, technologies, um, they take a while to get adopted. And that path of adoption is something that most entrepreneurs don't necessarily think about, either they don't know about it or they take it for granted. But it's a really critical thing. I can tell you, we experienced it with Entropy. Um, we're happily have crossed the chasm and, and now have worked, but I think the main part here is that we worked with some really visionary early customers who actually, we look back and they're more like partners or even friends. And these are people who share, or companies that share the same values as you. They look to your technology as a differentiator for them because they're also, they also happen to be mostly startups. And as they adopt you, they set the stage for the wider audience to look at the use of your technology. And so um, one of these early innovators, um, and this was a project, you know, again, close, close and dear to our heart because of the work that they do in the Philippines, uh, was working with um, an entrepreneur named John Climaco and a, a pioneer named Craig Calfee. Craig Calfee was the first uh, carbon fiber bike maker with Greg LeMond back when Greg LeMond was doing the Tour de France. 
And so Craig has built a reputation about pioneering and new materials, especially composites in the bike industry. But he defined, or he started a program called the Bambucero Project. And that was really about what can I use in developing economies in terms of locally sourced materials? How do I put that all together? Bamboo was a, a prevalent material. And he created a program where he taught folks in these developing countries like Ghana, the Philippines, how to make bicycles for either local use or for export back to the US where he was growing a market around these sustainable bicycles. And then John Climaco was a friend down in Los Angeles who's now started his own program called Bamboo Technologies where he's uh, creating workshops for makers who want to make their own bicycles and then also making bicycles for sale. So um, this was a great project to be a part of. They looked at us to provide sustainable materials that complemented the values of and the properties of the bamboo that they were using uh, to make these bike frames. And, and the cool thing is it's created jobs for people. Um, it's created transportation um, and in general just creates opportunities. And we love being parts of these projects. They may not be huge revenue generating projects, but for us to see that impact was very powerful for us. And I think in our eyes, um, that's how we kind of defined success for ourselves early on. It wasn't necessarily about revenue or anything like that. We just felt we want to be part of, of change that had a good impact on the planet and on society. And if we could participate in that and set a good example with what we do, hopefully success will follow. Um, and thankfully it did. Um, in, it took a while, but eventually the mainstream of the sporting goods industry caught wind of what we we're doing. Um, some of the ma major companies in the surf industry uh, adopted us at full production scale. And then, you know, we started to have notoriety with professional athletes riding our boards. Here's a picture of Kelly Slater when he won the Volcom Pipe Pro contest in Hawaii. And in the background there, you'll see the Firewire surfboard made completely with, with our materials. So um, this was a, 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 a nice milestone for us because it showed that there was some adoption and some traction for these initial ideas that expanded beyond kind of just the, the early visionary market and there was room to grow. Um, and so finally, kind of the last piece here was that as we got adopted by these larger companies, here's a picture of Burton Snowboards. He's the largest snowboard manufacturer in the world. They've adopted us at full scale production. Um, and they're a company we worked with for years around figuring out how do we work together to understand the impact of our materials in your supply chain. They're actually very quantitative about carbon footprint and sustainability is within their mission statement. And I think that's an important thing that we've also learned was that we look for customers and partners that, again, share these same values and appreciate the work that we've done in terms of quantitatively measuring uh, environmental impact and they put it in their own programs and it complements the, the mission that they're on uh, which does include sustainability and so by combining things that we're passionate about you know putting some technology in it and then actually creating a business we found a sustainable way to keep pursuing these ideas sorry <laughs> so um, that was great we kept making more stuff but uh, we started to ask ourselves, where, where does all this stuff go? Um, and it was kind of fortuitous at the time, this was like 2013, we met a young postdoc out of the Department of Chemistry here uh, named Stefan Pastine. He was working in the Frechet lab that worked on uh, responsive, uh, stimulus responsive polymers. And uh, by talking through our Berkeley network, uh, he found out what we were doing at Entropy and, and we met him at a trade show and he showed us a technology that could take things like these thermosets um, and, and basically make them recyclable. And so it answered our question of, oh, okay, where does all this stuff go? Once it's made, we can deal with it. And so we seed funded Kenora, we incubated Stefan and a couple scientists inside of Entropy for a couple of years. And in 2014, I joined as CEO um, to go fundraise and start building out the company once we had defined a, a, a you know, kind of a product line and had done some early R&D proof of concept. And so the whole premise with Kenora was picking up where Entropy left off, 
around making more sustainable materials, we decided to answer the question of, well, what do you do with those materials at the end of their life? And this kind of completed the picture for me, again, retrospectively looking back, um, you know, combining ideas of our passion with, some, with our skill set, you know, turning it into a business, but then really defining a need. And if you could define that need, basically, does the world actually need this? Um, for us, this really defined the purpose. And again, looking back, I think now it made the picture a lot more clearer. And so with full force, uh, we jumped into Kenora Technologies. Um, we've been around um, since I had mentioned, and we have our first products launching now. And I'd like to just kind of take this second part of the talk, talk about kind of where this technology is headed and kind of some of the bumps and bruises and hurdles that, that we've come across along the way. So again, this is kind of what happens to composite materials. So I showed you what thermosets look like um, in the composite. Turns out when you make composite materials, and there was a study done by um, the Composite Manufacturing Association here in the US, when you make composites, about five to 40%, depending on which industry you're looking at, in space and aerospace, it tends to be higher, um, maybe above 40%. Um, turns out all of those raw materials end up as waste. And, and even though these thermoset composite materials were invented 50, 60 years ago, the world never thought twice about how to make these things recyclable. Um, we just threw it all away. <laughs> and so if we take this specific case, the snowboard, right? The snowboards don't come out with this funny shape. They actually made square. Just like making cookies, you have to cut them out. And then what do you do with all that trim? Well, that was what all the scrap was that went to landfill. And some companies got creative. Down in the lower part of this slide, that's a, a picture of the Ramp Yeti, which was, uh, Ramp is a ski company in Utah, and they didn't know what to do with the, the waste, so they built a giant Yeti out of it. But you can only build so many Yetis. So, so this is the problem that we're solving, is what do you do with the manufacturing waste? It turns out you can also deal with the end of life waste as well for these products. So taking products that previously were not recyclable and making them recyclable. And if you think back to the composite slide, right? What were the things on there? We composite industry makes a lot of windmill blades, airplanes, cars. As I mentioned, our, our need for these materials is constantly growing. So we're, we have a growing problem here and it, it is a growing problem. And unlike the other type of plastic, thermoplastics, which again, we're also, engineered 50, 60 years ago by the chemical industry to become more recyclable, you know, the thermoset industry decided not to take that on. And so it seemed like a no-brainer. Why don't we just make these things more recyclable? Um, and so that, that was the journey that we, we embarked on there. Um, the existing approaches to deal with it, um, which are recycling methods, so typically composites could be ground up and then kind of used as filler material and things like asphalt. So that's kind of a upcycling or secondary use. You can also burn away the plastic and then reclaim part of the composite. And this is a, actually a growing effort now where volumes of aerospace waste are so huge that they can't even burn it fast enough um, to reclaim the valuable components like carbon fiber. So what we're doing is we're trying to create a solution for down the line. So we're, we're as an industry, we're still relying on these methods to deal with existing waste, but that's dealing with existing waste of non-recyclable thermosets. And so, you know, we're glad that organizations like the World Economic Forum recognize the need for this type of technology. Um, 2025, that's kind of good and bad. Um, as a startup, we're probably a little bit early, but we're glad that the big thinkers out there are in line with our vision. And so we, as long as we can survive that long, we, we hope that we'll have a, a growing market. And so how did we create a recyclable thermoset? Um, well, the concept is here. So the idea is let's make the thermoset recyclable from the start. We call this resin recyclamine. And we work with manufacturers to make their carbon fiber composites or whatever composite they're making. And it, we create the, 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 this is a representation of the plastic matrix of combining, remember the, the part A and the part B of the thermoset. And then we work with manufacturers to actually recycle the waste. Again, the end of life of the pr product can also be recycled here. And then the unique thing about our technology, we get back a thermoplastic material, which can be reused as a composite as well. And this cycle can, can continue on. 
Um, and in order to get here, we had to invent a new chemistry platform. So this is an organic synthesis method that, that we've kind of, there wasn't a lot of primary literature out on how to make these molecules. So we invented it, and this is where we spent a lot of time the last few years developing a full uh, synthesis platform that can make any recyclamine. And we had to look at the industry and think about how did the industry combine these molecules to make the epoxy thermosets. And so we designed a whole family of molecules. We have about a portfolio of about 30 different recyclamines a day that can be mixed and matched to tune the properties of these plastic materials depending on the application and use. And so we'll just walk through a typical, uh, this is what the chemistry looks like of, of creating the epoxy thermoset. And normally, again, epoxy resin with the curing agent. And as these molecules meet each other, they chemically react and form covalent bonds, meaning those bonds don't break, they're permanent. And that's what makes a thermoset a thermoset. Um, and so these are all irreversible bonds. Our trick was to put in a programmable cleavable bond into one of the molecules, right? And so this programmable bond responds to things like pH, and we can trigger it to respond to a variety of conditions. And there's a few other conditions required here, like heat and, and solubility. And if you're smart about where you put those things, when you cleave that thermoset, you actually get back a long chain polymer. That long chain polymer is our thermoplastic. And it turns out that this recycled thermoplastic has a lot of interesting properties that could be taken advantage of by the composites industry. The most important thing is it has really high adhesion. Um, most thermoplastics don't have adhesion. And so we're looking at ways to combine these properties in new applications. And so I'll just show a quick one minute video of what this process looks like. So you can see we have a, a typical carbon fiber sample there. We've engineered the chemical uh, solution to be uh, non-toxic and at low temperature. This is done at, at about 80 C. Um, we dissolve the plastic completely in the solution there. You can pull out all your reinforcements, uh, wash them, rinse them, reuse them, or recycle them or upcycle them. Normally that would go to landfill. And then the plastic which is in solution, we neutralize the solution and we get back the thermoplastic. And so that's the thermoplastic crashing out right there. And then this would be filtered, dried, and we're developing the industrial processes now to do this at scale. So we would filter and dry it and then pelletize it, and that's kind of what you see here. This is an injection mold grade thermoplastic with high adhesion, as I, as I mentioned. We can also con combine that plastic with things like carbon fiber to make fiber-filled pellets. And what, what you would do with these materials is then you would go make more products, right? And so we've, like, for example, in the surf industry, we've taken their waste and we're turning them back into fins that go back into the industry. We can also make car parts, right? And the idea here is to, within the world of materials, to play with uh, industrial waste and turn it into useful products that go back into useful applications. So, um, you know, here's an example of what we're doing in the snow industry, aside from, um, you know, recycling some of the plastics that normally went to landfill. We're using them to make products that go back into that industry, making things like bindings and goggles for that industry. Um, with surfboards, I showed you the fin, but the other cool thing is with the rise of 3D printing, here's an example in the upper, upper right here of uh, what's, what's uh, affectionately named the Dolphin Board of Awesome. There's an a, a, a innovative team working to make 3D printed surfboards, and so we can also take some of this plastic waste and turn it back into 3D printing filaments, which also would be recyclable. So this thermoplastic is continually recycled both by our chemical process and by heat melting. So we can create a cycle of reusing these materials in industries. And, and we've also been focused on transportation. So we, we've done some R&D with, with BMW and the Fraunhofer Institute. Um, and I just want to take a second to mention the National Science Foundation. Um, we've been operating under SBIR phase two grant, which started with a phase one and grew to phase two, and now have some additional funding through them. And I, and I have to say that federal funding is so important for developing new technologies, especially in in industries like chemistry and material science. These are long timeline, time cycle industries that unlike, you know, Sometimes I'm envious of the folks that are in 
the digital space because there's such a rapid pace of value creation. Um, and the others, there's, there's not as much support within the entrepreneurs um, uh, ecosystem, such as even down to investors who understand what, what is required here. I think what's nice to see are institutes like Citrus and Citrus Foundry specifically, um, Cyclotron Road up the hill um, that are really funding hard technology and in collaboration and working in close collaboration with federal agencies like NSF and DARPA and DOD and NIH funding fundamental basic research to create new technologies, especially in these fields. So um, a lot of this work was funded by them. And the whole point of this work was to create fast curing uh, systems that would work in a high throughput uh, manufacturing process that could make things like electric cars viable. And I think the exciting thing that I'm seeing now is that electric vehicles in, in automotive are now leading to electric vehicles in flight. And so the ideas of the uh, flying car, the flying taxi are real, and there are real companies working on these. These are vertical takeoff um, and lift um, uh, vehicles, and the idea here would be that in the future you could circumvent a lot of the traffic that we're seeing growing here in the Bay Area by using these types of vehicles that would be autonomous and, and all the other stuff that you guys read about. So um, there's an exciting world here around composite materials that we um, are enthusiastic to be a part of. And then, you know, just like our story with Entropy, we started small, you know, worked with the sporting goods industry, knew who our customers were, but we still have our sights on big applications where we think we could be really impactful. And one of these is the wind industry, where windmill blades are made out of composite materials. And this is an industry that has seen regulation affect its choices of materials. They had to switch from things like polyester, which had lots of styrene and VOCs, or volatile organic compounds, and make the move to higher performance, longer lasting, low VOC materials like epoxy. Um, they've, there are countries that have shut down manufacturing of those types of materials because these are large products. And so you release a lot of emissions when you make those products that, um, out of those types of materials. And so this is a very responsive industry, although their time cycles are really long. But these are ideas that we want to work on with them because they're finally seeing the first composite blades come offline and they don't know what to do with them. They're just burying them now. Um, it's really hard to grind up a 60 meter blade. So how, it would also be hard to recycle it, but those are ideas that we want to solve with the industry. And so the ideas here would be, again, using materials like ours where you could deal with the end of life and the manufacturing waste at large volume would be to recycle them and turn them back into products that go back into the industry. So going from a thermoset blade down to a distributed wind thermoplastic blade. And finally, the last application here is um, in the electronics industry, which is the largest user of composite materials um, in, in terms of epoxy composite materials. And so we do also have a project focused here on not only making these things more recyclable, but increasing the performance. And there's some unique properties of our recycled materials that we think could be amenable to this industry. Um, and so where we're at as a company now is really focused on developing the recycling process. And this is all nascent work that we're now kind of applying for grants and looking for partnerships and building that ecosystem out. So we've done the chemistry, we've done the manufacturing at scale. And now we're thinking about how to recycle it. And these are just some examples. And there's some materials here that I can go into with you guys at the end. Um, and then just like with Entropy, we want to understand the carbon footprint of the impact of recycling here. I think we can assume that it's lower energy, but we just really want to make sure and be quantitative about it. And so we've started collaborating with, with universities on studying that, that impact. And there's a lot more work to be done here. This was just a preliminary one. But it's encouraging because we can already start to see the reduced impact of even just this first bits of information. And so I'll just kind of close with where we, where, how we've gotten to where we are now and really what it took to get here. And I think the main theme in terms of impact entrepreneurship is that you really, and I think this applies to any technology in terms of commercialization, is you really need to be defined about your ecosystem, know who has the same values as you and build that network because it does truly take a village to take big ideas and try to make them a reality in, in chemistry and material science and hard tech. Um, and so I'll just 
one last slide that I just want to share is where do I see all this going? Um, what am I excited about today are advancements in interdisciplinary approaches to chemistry and material science. So back in grad school, I worked on designing proteins to make other higher ordered structures. And I think we're starting to see that become a reality now, combining things like you know, um, information science, um, high powered computing, uh, machine learning, automation and robots and applying that to chemistry. And it's a really powerful combination that will allow us to untap or to, to, to explore untapped regions of chemistry and material science versus kind of the approach that we took and the approach that a lot of the industry takes, which is kind of one by one iteration. And so the potential here is really exciting. At Kenora, we've been collaborating with systems biology companies to create new materials. Um, as well as information science companies to create new materials. And this is where we see ourselves continuing to invest for the future. So hopefully I've, I've shared um, enough about our story here and happy to answer any questions. Thanks. Maybe I spoke too much. <laughs> Your first project, the carbon fiber uh, board. Yeah. I was curious, why was the last? What was the problem there? And actually, I have a second question, too, uh, regarding your overall projects. Uh, and that is that many times, um, when you're dealing with a s uh, sustainable type of uh, enterprises, the uh, uh, economy is short term. You know, people are looking for short term profits yeah. and they don't really look at recycling and so forth, which is a longer term effect. So the money goes into, you know, making something quick without worrying about yeah. it the future. And yeah. how do you, what's your experience with that? Yeah. Um, Good question. Uh, I'll just start by answering the first question about the nanotube, the nanotube surfboard. That's that one's easy. Um, the side effect of having nanotubes in there was that these boards were black, and the surfboard spent a lot of time outdoors, and so these things were exploding outside uh, just by being left out in normal daylight because they were absorbing heat. And nanotubes also are thermally conductive, so there was probably some other side effect there. And so all the wax was melting off, and you know it just didn't make a lot of sense. Uh, I think surfers didn't care about having black surfboards. They also kind of didn't like, or they also kind of didn't really understand having a need for a more durable surfboard. They kind of liked the disposability of it in the beginning. So it's an interesting paradigm in that industry. I can't say it's representative of a lot of composites and sustainability, but it's a unique case. Um, and then in terms of the timeline and innovation cycles and kind of um, that that question. You know, one area I think of, of our frustration, I think a lot of companies that are startups in our space that really try to push the boundaries and take, take kind of a leap um, ahead of where the industry is thinking, is we're oftentimes first frustrated by thinking that the big chemical companies are really excited about innovation. I think on the surface, a lot of times they are, but once you dig deeper, you start to understand when you talk to business development people that it takes a lot to disrupt the machinery and the cogs within a big organization. And so disrupting that, even if you ask them to say, hey, make my new molecule, why should they turn off their hundreds of millions of dollars of manufacturing equipment to make your little molecule that's not gonna have any, any revenue? And so thinking about how do startups and big companies interact and where can you solve problems, um, that's a really critical part of trying to shortcut your value as a startup. And in our case, the reason we got a, a manufacturing partnership with a, a large um, Indian conglomerate called Adita Birla Chemical, they're the fifth largest epoxy resin manufacturer in the world, was because we have a, a total amine synthesis platform that whether or not it's recyclable can complement their existing products and allows them to compete at a global level against competition like the Huntsman, BASFs, and Avonics of the world. And so the value of that chemistry was as valuable as much as the recyclability. They also happen to be a very progressive, forward-thinking company, but their timelines are on the order of decades, right? They're thinking 30 years out where they know end of life is an issue that will need to be solved. So they're okay investing now, but those are the timelines that they deal in. I think we also got money from Samsung Ventures because they also 
are a huge vertically integrated company that has an experience investing in material science. And so they understand these things take tens, tens of years. Um, the frustration on our end and where we don't really jive is with a lot of the Sand Hill Road guys who run big funds that need to have quick cycles. And this is why there's opportunity for organizations like Citrus Foundry and Cyclotron Road and in partnership with individuals and even other investors who maybe want to see this type of impact. That's where the partnership of supporting innovation, I think, can can make sense for our, our, our industries. So hopefully that makes sense. Expand a little bit on the second question. I would like to focus on the business model of the sustainability or recyclability industry. Obviously, you know, in the absence of regulations and in the absence of policy and in the absence yeah. of some global uh, understanding, you would like to buy something cheap, you would like to manufacture something cheap, and you don't care what happens to it afterwards. So how much policy plays a role in all that in your business model? Yeah. Policy is important. Um, I think you know, Europe leads the way in that, and I think maybe followed by Japan. Um, I mean, we all know that we're lagging in, in that. <laughs> and, you know, reg you, some view regulation as good or bad, right? I mean, I, let's not get into that debate. But it is important for this field. And I think one a good example is the ELV, or End of Life Vehicle Directive, that is in place. It's law in Europe as of 2015. And, you know, that, that mandates about, I think the criteria is 85% recyclable materials must go into every new vehicle. So that means carbon fiber needs to be recyclable also. Um, now the question is, is burning recycling and does that qualify? They've actually went ahead and even classified that. They said only 10% can be recycled through burning. Everything else needs to be truly recycled. So um, that's important and that's forced the industry to look at solutions. And I think we don't have that here for transportation. And so, you know, you, you might not see it. I, I do think you need dynamics like, like my example in the wind industry, where regulation of volatile organic compounds forced them to change and adopt what turns out to be a better material, and these things last longer now, but they address the issue. So regulation is important, um, and I, I see geographically, you know, Europe's gonna lead the way in that. And so for us, I mean, we, our markets are actually a lot in Europe. Yeah, that's exactly um, the question that I had, too, was the impact of the regulatory framework. Um, so thanks for that response. It reminded me also of the recent implementation of a fee when you buy a new computer yeah. for recycling. And so I yeah. wonder, I guess, just following up on that, what role do the business associations play? You, know, you have the government regulators, you have the end consumer, but then maybe in the middle there's a way that the, that the associations can have an impact. Yeah. Um, let's take the sporting good example because we've actually seen that. So. Industry-wide organizations can take responsibility. Um, the ski manufacturing industry uh, had some ideas around rebates um, for you know, covering recycling, although their recycling was ma mainly grinding and sticking it into other plastics. Um, but it was an effort. Now, I think early on, especially with consumer good companies, it's maybe more up to the individual companies. And so what we are seeing are some creative new companies, some are startups, actually some are big, where they want to adopt new business models. So if we again go back to sporting good example, like the ski industry is really interested in their rental fleets because rental fleets turn over every year. And they think that, hey, if we could actually solve recycling here, there may be an actual lower cost for us if we're able to recycle the rental fleets internally instead of a lot of them going to landfill. Um, and so they're trying to promote this uh, and also even with just not even rental fleets, but just, you know, boards that you buy out of retail, um, they're thinking of programs where the consumer gets a rebate by bringing it back, a discount towards the new product from the same brand. And that creates customer loyalty. And so we're starting to see creative programs. And I think they're happening at the individual company level. But yeah, I think industry organizing is always good. I mean, I think we look at things like semiconductor industry that are highly standardized and that really helps push you know, kind of regulation and, and that, the agenda of the industry as a whole. Um, so it would be good to see some of that, yeah. Um, so in terms of um, sort of like doing hard tech startups and things like that, um, I think you said that you haven't gone through an accelerator program, is that right? I was just curious to hear your thoughts on like sort of the, you know, difference between going through an accelerator versus, um, you know, other ways of starting the company. 
Yeah, I think um, we, we kind of participated in some accelerator, in one accelerator program, Plug and Play Tech Center. Um, we were the very first company, even before they had defined a materials platform accelerator. So we were stuck into the IoT <laughs> class, which was interesting. But nevertheless, we saw that eventually they started a materials platform. But yeah, I wish Citrus existed when we started Ginor. I wish Cyclotron Road existed, or Citrus Foundry, sorry, to be specific. Um, so I, you know, Cyclotron Road doing the same thing. I think what they're doing is great. I mean, they're providing support and taking advantage of existing resources. Like, you don't need to build necessarily a new building just to have an accelerator. I mean, there's a lot of resources here, and people are coming up with ways to work together on campus to do that. So I think it's a great thing for hard tech. Um, probably the most important thing is to get non-dilutive funding through grants. And so in addition to the accelerator, accelerators will typically give you some seed money, but you should quickly go out and then go to the next phase. And the SBR program is probably the, our country's most powerful accelerator program. Um, and you have pretty good odds of getting it. So, and they really focus on hard tech and, and fundamental science that's like breakthrough impactful science. So, you know, every startup I talk to, I push them to SBIR program. Any other questions? Come on. Um, when, when you talked about uh, Kenora, you shared, you, you mentioned that this sort of, sort of research that, you know, sort of started early on and you, you know, then started talking about some of the customers you worked with. Can you talk about the experience of finding that first customer, especially within this space of, uh, you know, materials? Yeah. Um, you know, the first customer to approach us was, was actually a D2 Beerla chemical. Like, we gave a talk and they came right up and said, this is going to change what we do. Um, so that was just luck. Um, and I think the next customer to come along was, was someone like BMW, who, um, again, through hearing us give a talk, thought this could be impactful for what they do. But going from the first customer to, like, the next handful is actually the hard part. So you'll get lucky and you'll get the first few. I think it's important to also this, the whole lean startup method of doing customer discovery interviews is a really critical process because it's, it's the first five, you could believe everything you want <laughs> and, and think you're going to make the right product for them. But it actually takes maybe 100 customers before you get to the point of enough evidence that you're going down the right path. And so I think that was really the critical path for us was then getting out of the lab and we kind of did it backwards. Like, I wish we had done the customer discovery interviews before we even did the first R&D. And just ask people, what would you want in a recyclable resin? Maybe we wouldn't even made epoxy. We would have done something else. But, um, but that type of information is really critical. And so I think the most important part is to go out, get that information from the market, then go back. And then with that, you're going to create customers. And that's going to be your first set of customers. So. If I had to do that all over again, that's probably the way I would, I would do it. But yeah, it's hard to get that, that initial growth um, to scale. Great. Well, thank you very much, Ray, for a very inspiring presentation. Great. Thanks for having me.